My name is Richard Volsack. I'm president of the chamber, and it's a great, uh, great honor to, uh, to and a uh, uh, pleasure actually for me to introduce an old friend and a uh, really uh, important person to the chamber as well as to uh, this part of the world, uh, Frank Lavin. You know, there's a story that you know somebody for know people for a long time, you have friends for a long time, and you know we all kind of forget the background. Like, which school do they go to? Who, you know, that, and so the best way to get around that is to invite them to dinner with somebody who doesn't know them. Right? Then they, then they have to go through the whole routine to introduce themselves, and you don't embarrass yourself. And, you know, there's a lot of people around the, here today who have known Frank for a long time. But I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give a little more introduction to Frank uh, because I think it's a good reminder of uh, why it's important to listen to this, guy, this man when he's talking about the issue at hand here. Uh, Frank Lavin, of course, is now in another transformation as far as, as work activity. He's CEO and founder of Export Now. Uh, but previously, a lot of service in government. He served as Under Secretary for International Trade at the U.S. Department of Commerce in 2005 2007. That's an important, was an important role in our government, because, especially for AmCham, because in that capacity, he served as lead trade negotiator for both China and India and was a senior policy official in the department responsible for commercial policy, export promotion, and trade negotiations across the globe. He was also, as many of you know, he was a U.S. ambassador to the Republic of Singapore, 2001 to 2005, where his duties included helping negotiate the landmark U.S.-Singapore free trade agreement. In the private sector, uh, Frank served in a, as senior finance and management uh, various positions in Hong Kong and Singapore with both Bank of America and Citibank. Earlier in his career, Frank served in the, as, in the George H.W. Bush and Reagan administrations working in the Department of Commerce, Department of State, National Security Council, and the White House. He served as director of the Office of Political Affairs in the White House, 1987-1989. So a very distinguished career in government, and now, as I say, working uh, very vigorously in the uh, export space uh, in this part of the world. Uh, the preparation for all this activity, uh, of course, we all have to go to school, and, and, and again, Frank started out the right way. He earned a BS from the School of Foreign Service at Georgetown University, Master's of Science in Chinese Language from Georgetown, and an MA in International Relations and International Economics from the School of Advanced International Studies, SICE at Johns Hopkins, and an MBA from Wharton. So I got a couple more schools lined up to kind of cover the bases, I think, but not a bad start, Frank. Um, from our perspective at AmCham Hong Kong, uh, Frank Lavin was on our board until he started spending most, much of his time in mainland China, but he's very much connected with us online. Uh, as one of the ones here, uh, a, a great advisor to us on media, media relations activities as well as uh, uh, our government relations activities, both on the advocacy and positioning of the chamber on what we want to say, not only to the Chinese government, but Hong Kong, and especially the United States. So when I say it's an honor and a pleasure to introduce Frank Lavin, I make no bones about that being industrial strength true. So I'll turn it over to you, Frank. Thanks. Thank you, Richard. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Richard. That was very gracious, very kind of you. Thank you, everybody, for coming. Yeah, Richard, I, I, I got to work with him very closely on the board for a few years and uh, had to get off the board because I'm doing a lot of work in Shanghai. But I, I think I'm doing more work for you since I left the board than I ever did when I was on the board. So uh, uh, happy, to, happy to do so and uh, happy to be here today. Thanks, everybody, for coming. A lot of good friends in the room. And this is, by the way, this is about the third time we've done this, and it kind of goes back to a point Richard made. Uh, which is go back to my days in the White House political office. The point of this is not to, this is not an advocacy discussion, although certainly happy to have anybody's point of view. It's really just analysis. We're just trying to be data driven and just say this is what it looks like. So hopefully I'm presenting uh, just the facts, uh, but, but I'll, it'll be respect anybody's opinion or if they want to have a conjecture or theory as to why something should happen. So I just want to touch on all three of these, a lot to cover, but what I want to do is just try to lay out uh, what I see going on uh, now, and it's uh, you know sort of the 24-month window, and uh, and what it means for us today. So we'll just trot right through it. Look, the governing fact of the midterm election is captured on this slide that the 
president's numbers are pretty soft. And indeed, this is a few days old, so indeed Gallup now has it about 40. This is from Gallup.com. So, uh, so they're actually even slightly softer. So the bad news for the president is his numbers are off. The good, there's a little bit of good news in this, which is to say if you're going to have peaks and troughs, make sure your peak is up when you're up for your contracts up and you're up for renewal. So there's two great peaks here where there's two election moments and his troughs are between. So, so at least his, you know, he might have a tough time with popularity, but his, but his timing has been superb of that. But, that. but that is the governing factor, that it is a, there is a trend this year toward the Republicans, and I think it's primarily driven by the president's soft numbers. Um, so the, what are the core advantages? On the Republican side, interestingly, after having lost a few seats in the last two Senate cycles because <laughs> weak candidates, flawed candidates, candidates who couldn't command sort of broad popular support, the establishment candidates won every single contested primary this year ex except Georgia, where the anti-establishment guy won. But there are some very contested races in, uh, in Alaska and Oklahoma. Uh, uh, Mississippi, I should say, there are very few incumbents defeated. Virginia is the one exception, but other, other ways, Mississippi, Kansas, Tennessee, these guys had, the incumbents had challengers, sort of uh, Tea Party types or populist, um, but the incumbents won, the establishment fellows won, and the terrain itself uh, is Republican. By that I mean in uh, 2014, the class that is up is the class of 2008. So what you have in 2008 is, of course, the high watermark of the president's popularity. And so uh, if you're ever going to get an artificially weak Democrat who's dragged across the finish line, it would have happened in 08. So all of these folks are up. So we said, in order for Republicans to get control of the Senate this year, they don't need a Republican wave at all. They simply need Republican-based vote. They simply say, if voters vote the way they typically vote, uh, it will be Republican Senate. So you simply capture. If you simply have Republicans win Republican-leading states, it will be Republican year. So this is tough for the Democrats. Democrats have some advantage, still a money advantage. The president's still the top fundraiser in the country, and the White House controls the agenda. So, so the ability to navigate is a little stronger on the, Repo on the Democratic side. And, and I think the best example of this this summer was the president said that he was going to push off any, any decision on uh, immigration until after the election. So clearly anticipating that it would be unhappiness with what he's going to, going to put forward, but he, can, he controls the timing on that. Uh, quick look at the, uh, the states uh, on the governor's side. This is from realclearpolitics.com, one of the great ag grade sites. Everything here is pretty much true to type, and there's not necessarily a lot exciting here. There's, I think, two big variables here. Mark, we'd say Illinois is still up for grabs, and Florida is still up for grabs. That's the two, uh, two big variables. Uh, Pennsylvania is probably the largest state that's going to likely to switch Democrat to Republican. That's the biggest flip. That's, I think, state-specific activities. But there's, not, there's not a lot of exciting or, or unexpected developments uh, on this map. Everything's pretty much, pretty much uh, true to type. In the House races, I think you'd also say more of the same. People who people thought there might be some kind of tilt toward Democrats, probably a slight tilt toward Republican in the House races. Um, so and, and Republicans, assuming that's kind of an even split, Republicans will end up near a historical sort of post-war high, close to, close to 240 seats. So uh, I think this is also from real clear politics, but I didn't want to go into it. So, so in the governor's race is largely status quo, a few question marks, House races, slight Republican tilt. The real question is what's going to happen in the Senate races. This is an aggregate of what other people are saying. So this is uh, 538, which... Is, is my favorite go-to site for uh, political information, Nate Silver's site. This is New York Times, Washington Post, Princeton Institute of Politics, Huffington Post, Daily Kos, and they're all looking at the uh, likelihood of, uh, of a Republican takeoff. The outlier here are the Princeton folks, uh, but everybody else seems to think that it's going to be a Republican uh, takeover. This is from Vox.com that, uh, that did the takeover. Let me just drill, drill a little deeper into the top, I think we look at the top eight or 10 states uh, this is from 538, and so you can see, look, if you're a Republican, you'd be generally pleased with this, with this uh, screenshot, but, but the, uh, you can see the risk or the, the danger here is these are such thin numbers for the most part that it, there's still play out there, I think, but this just goes through the, the closest races out there. Um, some of the other races, there's going to be others, there are... Uh, 
three democratically held seats where the Democrat incumbent is retiring, and uh, but it's a Republican seat, and those are viewed as Republican pickups. That's uh, Montana, South Dakota, and West Virginia. So those don't even show here, because the current the current makeup of the Senate is 45R, 55D, but Republicans need to pick up six seats, right? Because the incumbent president wins ties uh, in the Senate. So Republicans need to pick up six to win. But most observers say, well, they're starting by picking up three. They're starting by picking up three uh, re Republican seats that had a Democratic incumbent. One of those, of course, Max Baucus's seat. So really, Republicans need to pick up three of these competitive seats. Uh, and it has to be a pickup, meaning if Republicans win Georgia, that's fine, but it was a Republican seat to begin with, so that's not a pickup. Uh, same thing with Kansas. Republicans win Kansas, that's fine, but was a Republican seat. By the way, that's the only Republican incumbent in the country who's behind is Kansas. Every other Republican incumbent in the country is ahead, and so you're competing against Democrat incumbents or open seats. Right? So Republicans have to hold on, a pickup in Colorado, Iowa, and then you know, Iowa, Arkansas, any of these other where there's a Democrat incumbent uh, running. But that's, that's I think, a, a pretty accurate play. Maybe at the end of this we can go and see if we can get up 538.com and see where it is, because this is, this is about uh, 24 hours old at this point, this chart. Uh, but a huge array of very close races. So it might be a uh, late night, and I should say not just a late night, but there are two states, Louisiana and Georgia, where the winner has to get a majority and they have a runoff provision. So you could easily have you know, somebody win Georgia 48 to 42, but there's because of a third party candidate, they've got to go to runoff. Um, my take on the policy environment for the next two years, not a lot going on. Uh, I think we're, we're still in a cyclical recovery, so we're still gonna be some good news there, but not, not an exciting amount. I think the presidential popularity continues to sort of be near the base. I think even if the Democrats hold on to the Senate, uh, their ability to shape outcomes is very limited. Uh, there's a, this is just a little bit of game theory, but there's a huge shift in party discipline just going from 55 to, say, 52, right? Because if you're at 55, you can enforce party discipline because you can tell any apostate, uh, if you defect from party leadership, we're still going to win, and then we'll come get you. So you can say that when you're 55. When you're 52, you can't say that. When you're 52, you're more of more of the supplicant, right? You're saying, please don't defect. I need your vote. But, but any, you know, what, if you're at 52, it more or less gives every one of those 52 people veto power. Not, not technically, because of course you have to have two people defect, but, uh, but the power shifts back to the individual senator and it shifts away from party leadership. So, so you have very limited control even if you're at 51 or 52. Uh, I, don't, I don't see a lot of good news in the international picture. Uh, I, I don't see an immediate threat or a challenge, but I just say that the, the downside potential is greater than the upside potential. Right? I don't see good news out of Putin. I don't see good news in the Mideast. I, I think China is China. Well, that's another lecture. But I, look, I, 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 don't, I, don't see, I don't see a huge amount of bad news, but I don't see much prospect for good news. Uh, no bipartisanship. This is the Affordable Care Act. This is Obamacare. Look, passion. On that phase, it fades as a salient issue, but I don't think it's going to be a winner for the Democrats as we go into 2016 either. So, uh, what's the policy environment for the next two years? The president's already said that he's going to do something after the election. It's not clear. It's interesting to me that it really transcends party lines, that there's really a big, big elite populist split where uh, elites of both parties tend to favor more open borders. There's a huge populist undercurrent that's not excited about that. Uh, uh, Trans-Pacific Partnership. Now look, the signals from the White House is once the midterms are over, we're gonna take this seriously. I'd say that's an open question what that means, uh, but, but, I, but I agree with the premise that it does require presidential leadership. The president's gotta speak on it. He's got to own the issue. He's gotta be personally committed to getting something through in order for it to get through. And the risk there is that you have a US administration and a Japan administration that want the symbolism of a victory but don't want to work against established constituencies so that you have a, a sort of an agreement of everybody to say we're really not going to have, a, have a, uh, an aggressive TPP but we're gonna do something and we'll declare the issue over. Uh, other issues that I think are kind of bubbling through the US 
political ecosystem are the class and race issues, uh, which I think are almost somewhat persistent. I mean, you hear a lot more of the inequality discussion. It's almost a, it, it means different things to different people, say that. And so it's a somewhat elastic term. It tends to then take on a very ideological prism where, uh, you know, people on the left talk more about uh, formal inequality or mobility. People on the right might tend more, more about mobility or about economic growth. Uh, and interestingly, it does run counter to uh, the immigration goals. You know, what's one thing that's, this might come up next year, but it's, but it's striking to me that there's been no White House-led or administration-led uh, response to Ferguson. Now, I don't mean in the formal legal sense of the, the particular legal issues there, but I meant about what kind of society do we want and what's the role of race in society and so forth. I think it'll come up in the State of the Union address and my my one prediction is that in a kind of a, you know, I'm sure people followed on TV, it was a pretty, there weren't any real heroes in this episode and it, and it was pretty poorly managed by the local police. But one of the, one of the exceptions to that is the, uh, the state, uh, state police, Captain Ron Johnson. And I said he gets to sit in the First Lady's box at the State of the Union, which is sort of how U.S. confers favor. Uh, 2016, on the Republican side, I, this is a little bit simplistic, of course, but I just broke it into two categories because my, my thesis here is this. My thesis is if Republicans can win, we'll talk about that, Republicans can win, but it's got to be someone who's broadly acceptable. And even if some people here uh, it might be flawed or have other kind of problems, I'd say anyone here is at least plausible uh, as someone who can capture the normal Republican voter. And, and forgive me if you know, you're heart of heart, you're for one of these guys. There are certainly things about them I like them, but I think they're just anti-establishment, and they have a choice of either moving a little more establishment or, or they, won't, they won't be successful. And by the way, just so you think I'm not knocking these guys, in recent years we've had at least two successful presidents or successful presidential candidates who started here and didn't migrate at least sufficiently here. And I'd say Barack Obama is one because he starts as sort of the anti-Hillary Clinton candidate. And Ronald Reagan was the other. He started as an anti-establishment candidate but sort of moved enough toward the establishment to the sort of assuage, uh, assuage people that he wasn't going to be radical in his approach to issues. So, so it's, it's not out of the question. But I think as, as things stand now, I think you've got, you, you say the Republicans are going to find a potential winner that comes from here and not if someone comes from that. The other note is, look, the American system is, the first part of this is a self-nominated part, right? I mean, these people all individually decide what they want to do, if they want to run or not, and there could be new names on this. So we say the first primary is just the stamina primary. Are they going to run or not? Are they going to organize their entire lives and their family and their personal finances and rearrange everything just so they can get in this race? And there's probably a six month window or so after the midterms where the dust has to settle and people have to be formally making moves and formally in the game if they want to do that. So we'll know very quickly uh, after the midterms uh, who here is for making moves or not. And we can come back to this in questions. Sorry. Uh, look, I think there's basically one Democrat. The, the Democrats don't have a, a, a chart. There's, there's certainly other people sniffing around. There's certainly other people sniffing around. But there is, th this is a situation where there's simply one candidate who I think has successfully cultivated all major Democratic constituencies and has national stature and so forth. Uh, so I, I think she's in a very strong position. I, I'd say this, that if you are a normally a Democratic voter and you said that's, you know, if, assuming there's not a scandal or some other kind of nominee, I'm very comfortable voting for a Democrat, you're going to be very comfortable with Hillary Clinton, right? So there's not a lot of space for competition. There is always some space on the fringe, right? But I think it's only for protest candidates. I don't think you can really mount a campaign from the fringe. But somebody might do it. I mean, there's Bernie Sanders now. There's always talk about Elizabeth Warren. Somebody might do it. I think, interestingly, there's more space in the middle. Uh, that would be Jim Webb or Joe Mankin, somebody who's sort of more populist, more blue collar. There's not a huge amount of space. I mean, I think she's in a very strong position. I think it would require some kind of mistake on her part to open it up. And there are certainly a strata of candidates, we should note, who are waiting for precisely for that. Right? There are strata of candidates who probably more or less uh, same philosophy or same view on issues as she has, but they know she's just so dominant. Joe Biden would be at the top of the list. There might be other people like John Kerry or Martin O'Malley. Governor of Maryland, there might be other people in that group, but I think everybody's just sitting on their hands until she gets in the game. Look, I don't think I'm saying anything new here that as a, as a retail candidate, I think she's got a lot of strengths uh, and, I, and I think there's some challenges she's got to overcome. 
which are, I think, largely uh, uh, tractable challenges, but she's got to come to terms with them and how adeptly she does that, how deeply she does that will, will matter. But I think if we, you know, if we were sitting down with her, I think she would, she would agree with all of those points, but these are, these are matters she can come to terms with, right? But um, this, this, uh, these, this second and third point are kind of, kind of similar, but I think that's the crux of her challenge, which is you're, you're coming from the incumbent party uh, and you have to say, I'm proud of my service in the incumbent administration, but I'm my own person, and I don't want to be dragged down by people who might not be excited by how well the incumbent's doing. So she's got to be able to straddle that. It's, it's easy, easier said than done. But, I, but again, I think she's fully aware of all of that, and I think you'll start to see that, that identity issue come to the forefront after the midterm elections. Frank? Right? Yeah. Can I, can I just ask you a quick question? Yeah. There's one factor you don't have in there. WJC. Yeah. No, no. I look. I think he's overwhelmingly a positive. But uh, as we saw eight years ago, he could occasionally get off message, and he occasionally becomes the issue. But I think he's overwhelmingly a positive because he has command presence, because he's been in this business twenty-five years. He knows everybody. So I think it's a huge, huge advantage for her. But, but you need to be careful about not getting in the spotlight, not becoming the issue yourself. And that happened at least twice in the 08 primaries after the South Carolina primary made a comment about, I can't remember what it was, but oh, he said, I, Obama went South Carolina and I think Clinton said something that I think was factually true, but the way he was sort of said it didn't help. He said something like, well, don't forget Jesse Jackson won that. So what he's, what he's, what he's trying to say is, look, minor candidates can sometimes win in South Carolina. It was perceived by people saying you're, you're sort of diminishing Obama, or you're saying that this is what black candidates do. Or I mean, it didn't it didn't come off right. Uh, so you've got to be careful about overshadowing, right, uh, your spouse. Uh, look, I think he would get that too. You know, look in the heat of the moment, you don't know what's going to happen, who's going to say what. And and by the way, this gets into if you say what are the most sensitive areas here, the need for her to establish an independent identity, and uh, say I'm proud of my work in the previous administration, but I'm my own person, uh, that's going to somewhat, uh, I think, use Bill Clinton's presidency as the sort of reference point. So she's really going to say, I stand from the Bill Clinton, you know, when we had good economic numbers, good deficit numbers, reasonable international posture. So she's going to be tempted, I think, to use that as her reference point. Look, that's, that's not a bad idea. It's not unhealthy. The question is, at some point, does some of this chafe the current administration, do they say, you know, you, it's, it'll behooves a Democrat, it'll behooves anybody to run against the incumbent president of their own party, right? So you, so it's a little bit of, so you have to be gracious and complimentary toward the current team at the same time, say, we're going to do a better job. It's a little tough. But the point is, to your point, if there's a misstep rhetorically, it might be in that specific area, right? If, if he starts saying, again, innuendo counts, or he starts saying, well, in my presidency, we managed to do X, Y, and Z. You know, and that's and you say, all right, fair enough. That's a factual statement. But if somebody in the White House says, I know what he's saying, yeah. he's he's trashing us, and he's saying, don't don't look at what Obama's doing. Look at what I did, right? So there, look, there's all sorts of grounds here for personalities and egos and psychology, and you only have to go back to those final months of the Al Gore campaign, where his relationship with Clinton was very strained, uh, to see, you know, if it doesn't work right, it can hurt the whole ticket. Or Bill Clinton. You know, it's not a question of his popularity. That's not what we're talking about. It's not. It's a question of his behavior and how what he might say and how the Obama people take it, and a question of sort of propriety of a spouse overshadowing the candidate. I mean, so there's. But it's not a question of saying. No, I'm, I'm wondering if you know people in, in the states will vote will, will vote for Hillary, thinking, well, it's it's a it's a twofer. You know, we get Bill back as well. Maybe, but boy, I'd say this. I'd say this. If she cannot run and win on her own merit, she's got some real flaws. If she has to say you're ambivalent about me, you don't think I can quite do it, but don't worry because I'm married to a guy who's pretty capable. I think that's a very flawed way. I think you have to say I'm running for president to lead this nation, and I'm going to take this nation in the right direction. You have to say I own this job. I think you can also say as a PS, you know what? 
I got to learn how to do it from one of the great leaders of the post-war era, and I'm very proud of you. So I think you can use that as the icing on the cake, mm -hmm. but I think I, if she were asking me how to write the speech, I would not say you get, get well, two I of us. I think, I think it diminishes her. It diminishes <laughs> her, right? So, uh, so she has to stand on her own merits. Yeah, and, and, and frankly, I don't think she has to do anything to, to like put that out there. I just think. Right. No, I agree. I agree. It's kind of clumsy. If you have to say, by the way, my husband used to be president. I think it's a little, a little bit of a, a reach, I think, to, if you have to say that. No, I think, indeed, it's so universally known, it's kind of a mistake to. She'll, she'll reference it in no, her acceptance speech. I'm just wondering if that's going to be, you know, there are a lot of people who aren't Democrats who voted for Bill. Bush, yeah, he, he was. Who will vote for her because he's. Well, that's what I mean about I think the way to do it is you use the Clinton administration as a reference point. You talk about how the economy performed in the Clinton administration and how U.S. international position was respected. So you use that as a, as a reference point for your campaign. If, if the Republican message is, uh, look how bad things are, her response is, I've got another example for you. So if, the, if part of the Republican message is, do you want to spend the rest of your life down there? Don't we want to get going? I mean, she's got a, her response to that is, well, we have some things going well in the Clinton administration. So I think that's the way to frame it. I wouldn't frame it in terms of personalities. I wouldn't say, if I'm in a tough spot with the economy, I'm going to ask Bill. I, mean, I, just, I think that hurts her, right? But I think, you, but you, but you do. To your point, you do reflect back to positive memories of the Clinton era. So, yeah, I think that took us to the uh, final slide. Look, the final point: if we say there are three variables in a presidential race, the two of them being the quality of the two nominees, and the third being the overall environment. I think the one that we really have an answer to is, is the first one. And when I say that Hillary Clinton will be the scene, I mean she will uh, capably appeal to the normal Democratic voter. If anybody says, I usually vote Democrat, I usually have sympathetic to her message, that person will be very, very comfortable with her. Right? So, so the Democratic vote will be at ceiling or near ceiling. What we don't know is how capable or broadly being the Republican nominee is, right? because I said there are several who can performance ceiling, but you don't know, and some of these guys are starting at state level and they have to get their game up. So that's more of a question mark. And the biggest question mark, though, is the last one, which is the president, to my mind, got at least get off the net, the soft numbers where he is, get his numbers up a little bit. Uh, otherwise, it still it remains a drag. Meaning, the, the, the important question for 2016 is, is it going to be a change election or continuity election? And the American political gestalt is, we need a change, then she's in very tough shape anyhow. She's, look, she can still make the point, I stand for the right kind of change, right? I stand for change from where we are, but not radical change to Republicans. So she'll still have a point to make, but it's a tougher sell if the national mood is, you know what, it's not working and we need to change, right? It's just tough for the incumbent party to stay in. So this is, this is the most important question mark for, uh, I think, Hillary Clinton, is that the, the president's got to, got to get his numbers up a bit uh, for her to be competitive regardless she might perform at her ceiling, but the Democratic ceiling in 2016 might be 48 percent. So, that's that. but that, that that's the lay of the land. So, good. Thank you. Thank you, Frank. Well, now we can now. No. First slide. First one. Now we get to the now we get to the meat of things. This is where we get to pick his brain some more. Let me ask the first question, and then we'll, we'll get going. And that the one thing that wasn't mentioned. Uh, it's, it's, that's the right slide. Yeah. On the quality of the Republican nominee. Yeah. The question is, can the best candidate win the primaries? It's not clear. I mean, I, I, I think, uh, yeah, best is a loser. term. I mean, I, I let me rephrase that. A person who appealed to the general election. I think you say, can an adequate candidate win the primary? So, uh, <laughs> so, so say this, so take the Hillary Clinton point. Can Republicans nominate someone who would appeal to the normal Republican voter? So that if you're normally sort of right of center, or comfortable with Republican philosophy, you say, sure, I have no problem at all voting. Most people here, more or less, the answer is yes, this was my point. So here, I think you've got some, some structural flaws. But people here have flaws, but they, like Hillary Clinton's problems, they're largely surmountable. I mean, you need coaching, you need to, to improve their game up. And I also say, look, half of these guys won't run. So I think what it really comes down to is, um, especially in the early primaries, can the establishment types consolidate quickly enough so that there's a very small field so that the more doctrinaire or more ideological types don't dominate? Uh, that, that's 
a huge question for Republicans. I'll, I'll say this, what usually happens in American politics, not always, but usually the, uh, both parties' establishment tends to win, right? So, and I think, I think both Cruz and Paul have their set of problems as well besides, you know, more limited appeal. But, but what it requires is a real, a real shrinkage of this field to, uh, to let establishment types to consolidate. Yeah, and if I don't do that, then, you know, the uh, general picture of where the Republicans lost big as far as not, not enough people were voting, uh, uh, blacks and Hispanics, sure. and, uh, of course, the immigration issue having a role of that. Uh, do you think the party is better positioned this time around? Yeah. Um, you know, I, 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 it's an interesting question to say, did Romney lose because Romney had just flaws, and if he'd been sort of a better version of Romney, he would have done better? Or did Romney just lose because it just wasn't a Republican year? I mean, Obama had enough goodwill and enough of the national mood uh, that it kind of didn't matter if, you know, if Romney was 10% better or, or more adept or whatever flaws were. I'm ambivalent, you know, of course we can't replay it, so I'm ambivalent about that. I think, I think Romney passes the test that I laid out there that says, you know, could he more or less appeal to uh, the average Republican vote? Would most Republicans feel comfortable? The answer to that was yes. I think Romney's big problem uh, was this. What, I'm sorry, was the, uh, was just the political environment that, that people were just more receptive at that moment for Obama. I said, give, He's had four years, not necessarily great results, but you don't want to fire the guy after four years. Let's give him another time. But there just wasn't a mood. Uh, I mean, his negatives really fell apart after those midterms, right? After, after his reelection. That's when they, so, so I think it's very tough to win and beat a guy who's, you know, riding up like that. Yeah. But look, I, I agree with your point. There's a threshold of performance the Republicans have to hit in order to be competitive. And it's not just that threshold, it's that when you, you know, Hillary Clinton has a huge advantage of being sort of national level politician for 25 years. Most of the Republicans are sort of state level. So getting, getting from state level to national level is a, a growth curve. Uh, getting through what might be fractious political environment in a primary where there's, see, I think Hillary's gonna avoid all that. I mean, there might be some nominal opposition, but I think she's largely gonna have a clean sailing where Republicans have a fist fight for several months, turns people off. So Republicans have some structural advantages, but we can't, Evaluate them now to say, look, was this, was this something that faded very quickly, or did this plague you for six months? We we can't say. I, and by the way, again back to Romney. Look, he had yeah, he had tough primaries. He had a bit of a fist fight, but it, but it, that isn't what hurt him at the end. I think if he had clear sailing, you know, he still would have lost. I just think I just think it's it's very tough. You know, Obama's popularity is high enough that you're not going to beat the guy. So when I said before, the real question for 2016 is it a change election or a continuity election? I think what very clear in 2012 was a continuity election. They said, look, we, even if we've got reservations about Obama, we just don't think he should be fired, right? So, and Republicans just didn't present a compelling case to say, well, you've got to fire that guy and hire me. It just, just didn't capture the imagination. Another question? Here we go. Uh, very insightful, Frank. Oh, well, thanks. Very insightful, as always. Uh, and I'm not going to ask you if Brian sent Monica a check to appear in Vanity Fair right now, because that's you know, a frivolous question. Um, what I am going to ask is, um, I, it seems to me that foreign policy leadership, the commander in chief thing is going to be really big in this election uh, because of what we've seen with Putin and ISIS um, and even the Chinese building a landing strip in disputed water. So um, how much of a factor do you think uh, Hillary's record as Secretary of State has been and is it good enough to really uh, help carry her over? Yeah. It's hard. But by the way, I think, I think your point is true. Your premise is true uh, if something comes up. If some, I mean, means I think there's a general view, probably the majority view now, that the United States international posture is not what it should be. The United States international leadership is not what it should be. So there's a sense of underperformance. I don't think necessarily a lot of that sticks to Hillary Clinton. I think she's a, you know, maybe it should, maybe it shouldn't. But I think she's able to say, you know, when I was on watch, we were OK, and things fell apart more recently. You, you can you know, accept or reject that. But I think, however, to your point, I think the saliency of this really spikes if something happens. You know, if there's something in the South China Sea or Putin does something or ISIS does, I mean, if something happens then. So in general, international posture, I think, is a low saliency issue. People don't care. But all you need, all you need is something to happen. And they say, what are we paying these guys for? So look, I, 
I don't know if it goes directly back to her and her tenure as Secretary of State, but I think it goes directly back to the president's numbers to say, we just, this guy doesn't have a sense of America's role in the world. Guys around the world are wrong footing us. We're not astutely defending our interests, and we just need some adults in this picture. So that, that's, that's how I think it feeds back. So, yeah. Uh, yeah, thanks. On the, the first one, just say a bit more about that, because you know, the, the current administration can yeah. basically tell a story that it kind of saved the world and, and that it's the economy, as you say, now is yeah. not doing that badly. Yeah. What, 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 what will the Republicans kind of, or why is that not more of a positive than it is? And what, what will yeah. the Republicans do? I think it's very frustrating for people in government to say, you know, our numbers are pretty respectable, but there's no applause. I think it's very, I got to tell you, if you want to have a, just just book, go, book a good amount of time, but if you want to have a lengthy discussion, just talk to anybody who is with the, George W. Bush uh, 2000, uh, 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 re election campaign, right, from uh, 92, right, where the economy had been soft, but actually the, when the quarter that he lost to Bill Clinton was something like 4% growth, right? But he was just eviscerated for bad economic management, bad numbers, and you're hopeless and you're worthless. And I mean, so there was just no, there was no love. So I think you'd say one thing the American public has high performance standards for those set of variables and low tolerance. And I think the other problem the current president has is I think is generally yes, it's viewed as good performance or some good directional numbers, but consistent with historical trends, that we're not in a boom period, people aren't feeling good. And there's a third problem, which I think is the wage problem. So unemployment is improving, uh, but wages are not. So I, look, there's just not a lot of applause for the president. And you could, it's in all of his speeches, you know, that. I, sort of, I mean, he says it obviously better than this, but he sort of says, I deserve a little applause, don't I? And, uh, and he's just, he's not getting it. He's not getting it. So, uh, and I think, I think that's where we're going to be two years from now, right? I think it allows his base to feel comfortable with him. You have done a good job, right? right? But I think but people are say, skeptical. As you say, the, the main counter argument is the kind of inequality one, which seems to be a hard counter argument for the Republicans to focus on. Counter argument or? or well, uh, as, as to why the, the economy is not, is not as good as it looked. Your point about wages. Yeah, if you, uh, yeah, wages, yeah. Uh, if you look at uh, things like consumer confidence, business confidence, it's pretty flat. It's pretty flat. I mean, nobody's, nobody's feeling this is a time for expansion, it's a time for hiring. We're in a really aggressive part of a cycle now. People are, I think people are saying, look, we came out of a mess, and there's sort of a natural recovery from that, but we don't feel optimistic about it. it, it I mean, that's, just, that's just where the data is in the United States. Yeah. Well, back to the point, is it a continuity election or a change election? I mean, the Democrats are going to have to say, we're actually doing all right. Yeah. There, there's a lot of good numbers out there and keep, keep it on track, right? And we'll see, we'll see if that has traction with the middle class, with the swing of voters. Yeah, Mark. Frank, I was just going to follow up Bob's, Bob's question because I think it, it's, it's a good one. In terms of what the Republicans have to do, maybe they don't have to do too much, do they have to come up with truly alternative economic policies that would that looks, say, is a change election that would change things? Because there's a strange thing going on in the sense that even people that are Republican voters, they seem still to blame the government and in some cases want the government to do more even though... Well, that, in, that's, in fact, a, that's, yeah. America. that's America. Yeah, yeah. That's a, so in fact, in fact that, you know, that's not what made them say. Is, is, are there substantial policies out there and is it going to matter? Will be important? No, well, listen, I think you put your finger on a very important point. I think a, a lot of what drives the midterms are going to be grievances and unhappiness with uh, the president. But I think Republicans have to shift from a grievance message to uh, an affirmative message, an optimistic message. Uh, if they want to, you, you're not going to vote. Even if it's a change election, people are saying we're not happy where we are. You have to offer that alternative. By the way, I would guess, I would guess people here, they know that, that you can't, America is not going to vote for a malcontent, not for, vote for someone whose primary message is one of just saying I'm unhappy. Right, so you've got to really steer away from that, or use that as light seasoning. You know, you can make a joke or something. Well, I, I had a, you know, I've got a very good friend who uh, close to Ted Cruz, and I said he has got to decide. I think a very, very bright guy, very articulate guy. Uh, I said he has got to decide whether he wants to be Jesse Helms or Ronald Reagan, right? And so whether he wants to just to speak to a party or one faction party, or whether he wants to speak to the nation, right? And if he just wants. He wants to be the guy who just gets applause from the base. That's a great career, but you're not going to be president, right? It's who can get applause from the base and then go beyond the base, right? So that's, and I don't know if he 
would agree with that analysis or if he says that's what I want to do. Rand Paul, whether you agree with him or not, he says, no, no, this is my philosophy. This is my philosophy and I'm here to share my philosophy with you. So I'm not here to accommodate anything. I'm here just to tell you what I think. And he's, you know, he's a very libertarian guy. So, I mean, he has the advantage of sort of authenticity. The problem is there's a real ceiling on how far you can push that with American voters. It's, you know, I think many, I think you could say a majority of Americans might have some libertarian instincts or impulses, but it doesn't always govern every decision. So they might be sympathetic to some of the themes of his message, but they wouldn't necessarily vote for a doctrinaire uh, adherent. So, uh, so, but, but I think that's just where he is. I think that's just sort of a personality dimension of him. So, so yeah. I, I don't know if I, I necessarily agree with that because I think why Romney lost was a lack of authenticity. Mm -hmm. I, I think that Romney ran to the right and you know, he, he really came off as somebody with no real moral could, center. Could be. And could be. It looks too opportunistic. Some, I think something like a Rand Paul, yeah. who, you know, it's nobody I would ever vote for, but no, I think he could capture the imagination. I, 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 I think you're right. May, may, yeah, maybe. I think Romney did suffer from that. I'll, I'll tell you, though, to the extent that matters, uh, I think it's really good. I mean, because I think, I think she's generally viewed as a very calculating person to say, you know, if you ask her, tell me what you think about X, she will say, I'm only, I am only going to tell you what is pleasing to the majority of Americans. The answer, whereas to your point on Rand Paul, he'll say, I'll tell you what I think about X. Right. right? No. Even though 90% even though of America might disagree, but I will tell you. But so, I so mean. Just, I think the, the play comes in. So Hillary is not viewed as authentic, but she is viewed as, as qualified and knowledgeable. Yeah. And so whom the Republicans yeah. put, if you put a Rick Perry, you know, who has to yeah. have a coloring book to learn foreign policy. Yeah. Uh, yeah. She, she takes him out, I, I think. Well, I, that's, I think if you have yeah. a Rob Portman yeah. who has some gravitas, that's another story. Yeah. Uh, it's hard to measure the ultimate appeal or ultimate effectiveness of specific candidates. It's, it's very hard to do that. And all of these guys will grow a bit or evolve a bit. Look, as we were talking a few minutes ago, Hillary Clinton's ability to define herself against this challenge is an open question. Although, as you point out, she's pretty bright, and she'll her acceptance speech is going to be key to saying I've got to define myself on my own terms and still be respectful of a president in whose administration I serve. So I, my guess is she'll pass this test, but will she pass it adeptly, or how or will her husband say? I mean, those are all kind of open questions, right? And will who on that Republican side will outperform or underperform? or redeem themselves or fall flat on their faces. You know, but we know there's gonna be a bell curve distribution, right? There's gonna be someone who you'd always viewed as, was that the guy was a bit weak, but he actually seems to be doing a decent job over several months. So, so, you, so it's very hard to sit here and say, you know, I like A, B, and C at all. The, my guess, just to get into personalities, my guess is Rick Perry is running nominally. He's, he's acting a bit like a candidate. He's not running, but he's acting like a candidate for two reasons, that he wants redemption from a very, Kind of foolish campaign for four years ago, where he just he was just clumsy, he was ill adept, and he and he and he fell apart very quickly. So part of what he wants to do is just re personal redemption, and the other thing he wants to do is to make is to try to put a knife into Ted Cruz because he's going to, you know, this guy was governor of Texas for ten years, his lieutenant governor, his loyal lieutenant governor, running for the Senate nomination uh, as the establishment candidate. Ted Cruz comes in and beats. Rick Perry's guy for the Senate nomination and becomes a senator and now is a sort of folk hero in his constituency. And I'm sure that Rick Perry cannot abide any of this. And, and he's just trying to get out there to take up a little bit of space to constrain Cruz's ability. No, I guess. So I, I'd, be, I'd be very surprised if Perry actually formally runs. And also, you know, we know the American media and the American public too that there's higher a little lift in numbers, a little lift in opinion when people leave the field or people walk away from power. The point is, if he ever wants to get a positive editorial, it will be if May of next year he says, you know, I've thought about it and I'm not going to run. And that's the one time in his life he's going to get a positive editorial from the New York Times that says, you know, it was a gracious statement and he added to this race or something. So, so I, think, I, I think that's what he's doing. So, so. Yeah, Bob. Just to uh, add to the you gotta, gotta get the mic. Wait, wait, yeah. Um, sorry. Um, 
Thank you. Just on the discussion of Hillary, if you, I, I perused her book, her campaign book, and your first, the first bullet point on your Hillary page, there is no vision at all. N nowhere. It's yeah. devoid. Yeah. And so in your experience, uh, yeah. starting from now and moving forward, yeah. is there enough time for her to develop and sell a vision? I, yeah. I guess so. This is what I was saying. When Ivan said, look, she's got a lot of experience, which is true. She's very bright, which is true. She knows every issue is true. It's true. She's been around for 25 years, which is true. Republicans have a word for that, and the word is Bob Dole. Is to say, you know what, we don't always go for the person who's been around forever. Right? And, and Bob Dole's a very capable guy and, and, and knew his issues, no, no rough edges, broadly acceptable. But, but boy, where, where are you going to take America? And by the way, I voted for, you know, I'm comfortable voting for the guy, but, but he really fell short. He had spent so much time in the engine room, and I think in his life, that to say, well, now you've got to go up on the bridge and steer the ship. I, I just don't think that's, that's what his instinct was. In fact, his instinct is sort of a Senate you know, mechanic, a Senate leader is I've got to calibrate strong personalities and conflicting emotions, and my job is to sort of find the, the median, you know, point here and then get a piece of legislation through and say, all right, that, but that's not leadership, right? That's kind of impressive. Uh, but that'd be the question on Hillary Clinton is to say, look, have you spent your life sort of calibrating so well that the, where do you want to take America? And, and who in America wakes up saying, America will be better off if X is president. If, if this, now, Obama had that, at least initially. Obama had people really passionately believed in him. He was a very charismatic guy. Still, he's charismatic. But he really had a base that said America will be better off if Barack Obama becomes president. And I don't know if that same constituency exists, or certainly not in the same way for Hillary Clinton. But to the point that was raised a second ago, does it exist for any of these guys, or can any of these guys build out as well? Right. So uh, yeah, look, I, again, I think if you were sitting, uh, I'm putting words in her mouth. I, I've worked with her on some projects, but I'm not, certainly not a confident. I think she would say, look, we're going to build this out step by step, right? Uh, the culmination of which is my acceptance speech for the nomination. But I've got to be mindful of being too aggressive on that uh, because of these other two points. And by the way, in the primary states, I don't need a lot of this. In the primary states, the primary states are more brick by brick placating constituency. So you're back to you know being a good Bob Dole in the engine room, just making sure everybody's kind of comfortable and happy, right? And then once the primary's over, you start to wear the hat of the nominee and talk about national leadership. I think if you asked her, she would say something. I mean, that's, that's more or less true. How can she do it? How well she do it? Beats me. It's an open question. Frank, uh, what is your take on uh, Liz uh, Warren? You know, she got her first book, and I think she's having a second book out. Yeah. And she's getting all the rock star treatment, and yeah. her message kind of resonates with yeah. a lot of young yeah. people. Sure. And, you know, the, and, and I think sure. Hillary, there's oh, every now and then, stick, there's a scene as someone who's so de a, a detached from the mainstream, uh, get very close to the, uh, the, the fat cat in Wall Street, and so on and so forth. So, I don't know what, uh, uh, what a hit. Well, I think there is space on the left because, you know, look, she does have kind of an establishment background. And, and there's always, look, both parties will always have a, an element within them that is sort of anti-establishment and, you know, draws their, draws their support from, from people sort of throwing rocks. I, I, just don't, I just don't think it's a huge amount. See, the reason Barack Obama could do it eight years ago was one issue. There was one issue that allowed him to do it, and that was the Iraq War. She voted for the war, I'm against it. So it was very passionate interest. The other interesting point, look at the data now, something like 400 public opinion surveys, public surveys that took place in uh, 2007 uh, on the Democratic primary. Of these 400 surveys, Hillary Clinton got between 40 and 50% and well over 95% of these surveys, right? So she was always lead. She never cracked 50%. So what you're really saying in 2008 is, uh, she's got it. She's got it in the bag. Nobody comes in here. The only, the only scenario under which she could lose is if her opposition collapses so rapidly that there's one opponent. Because she's never cracked 50. I mean, there is, a, there is some hesitancy about her, right? But she's, she's, dom she's beating these guys 45 to 15, right? She just dominates them. So unfortunately for her, all these other, you know, the seven dwarfs, I mean, it was, you know, it was uh, uh, John Edwards, right? Uh, Bill Richardson. Uh, Chris Dodd. I mean, it was kind of a weak field when you think about it. Obama was the only one in that field was really dynamic, charismatic, against the war. I mean, so it was, it was 
really a great deal for him. So the point is, yeah, an insurgent can beat an establishment candidate, but I think those particular circumstances are unlikely to repeat. I don't know what Elizabeth Warren's personal calculus is. My hunch is she doesn't run because she occupies a space in the system now. What you're really saying is the protest candidate, you're saying, you know what, I've got nothing to lose. It's time for me to throw a rock at the leading candidate because I, you know, who cares if I create ill will or if I burn bridges? It, do it doesn't matter, right? So the real, the real ideologues tend to get out there and say, "Watch me! I, I bet I can hit her from here," and uh, and they, they, they fling that rock. I just don't think I think she's as you know an emerging senator with a constituency. I think she's got much more of an incentive to play in in the system. Bernie Sanders though fits that model. Bernie says, "Look, I'm pretty old. I'm never going to be part of what's going on in D.C. I might as well throw a rock, right?" So, uh, so it's so it's more. I think it's more appealing for, for him to to be the, to be the, insurgent than for Elizabeth Warren. But look, I'm not. This is just my conjecture, and I think it's a lucky day for Hillary Clinton and Bernie Sanders yeah. out there because he's not. He has no executive presence, to put it politely. I mean, <laughs> I mean, it's the op I mean, Obama might have the exact same message as Bernie Sanders, but the guy has enormous stage presence, right? So. So it's good for her. He'll take the oxygen out of the room on the left and get 11 percent or whatever. Right. And assuming Hillary is going to win, what, what is the implication for U.S. China relations? She's not steady well, well enough in China. So that's closer to home than there. Yeah, but, I don't, but I, I look, I think she comes, she is an establishment figure. I mean, as I agree with Ivan Tate, you know, she's, she's going to come from the establishment internationalist side of the Democratic Party. She's, she's hemmed in a little bit by some people on her left. But, uh, you know, which means I think she sees a U.S. leadership role. She's, uh, she's going to be much more uh, willing to be forward-leaning on use of force or proxies of use of force like arms for insurgents and so forth than uh, President Obama is. I don't know if there's one distinctive Hillary Clinton view of China. I don't know if there's any ill will toward her in China. I think you know, China always tends to gravitate toward the known quantity. So I think they at least say, we know you, we know your husband. So I don't think there'd be a, I don't think they'd begin with a negative view of this. Uh, it seems the discussion assumes gender out of the discussion. Do you think it's an issue at all? And for example, commander in chief questions, or, or is it, has she succeeded, or has the country succeeded in eliminating it? So is gender an issue in the general election in 2016? I don't, I don't think there necessarily be anything distinctive about gender performance. Uh, I mean, the, 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 I guess the supposition is something like this, that there'd be a constituency that might normally philosophically want to vote for Hillary Clinton, but they're just, they're just misogynist. They just can't abide it, right? Yeah, I, my guess is empirically there's somebody like that. But by the way, there's always somebody on the other side as well. There's somebody who says, look, I'm philosophically much more oriented toward the Republican nominee, but I'm just excited about a woman. I mean, so there's always, and, and by the way, the good thing about America, those numbers tend to be so, so, it's very hard to measure. It's very hard to even find those people. I remember when mayor of Los Angeles, uh, Thomas Bradley was running for governor of California against George Duke, Duke Majin, who's the attorney general, and Bradley's the, a black guy, he's a Democrat, and Duke Majin's white guys of Armenian descent. And I remember polling data said, th th this is 30 years ago or whatever. So, but somebody actually, and it's hard, it's hard to measure bigotry because people are, have conditioned responses, right? So you have to go through a series of kind of indirect questions. But somebody had come up with a survey and they said some, some kind of large number at that time, was it like 12% of Californians said they would never vote for a black person for governor. It was kind of a surprisingly large number. But then they, same survey, battery, that you're on said, well, 20% of Californians would never vote for an Armenian for governor. So, <laughs> you know, but I mean, the point is, but the point is both, both, of those, both of those numbers are preposterous numbers, right? I mean, because both of them did very well, both of them were very popular. And it just, I mean, so I'm sure there's somebody out there who says, you know, I cannot, I cannot abide a woman. I don't think she's up to, I'm sure there's, that person exists, but I just don't, it doesn't even show up in the, in the data. You know, Democrats tend to outperform uh, Republicans among women voters, but interestingly, Hillary Clinton's Hillary Clinton has the same results, meaning she doesn't, there's no special swing or special gender identity with her from that, so. Going back to the uh, midterm elections yeah. coming up, uh, yeah. assuming that it goes the way the numbers suggest and, and Republicans take the Senate, 
um, it may cause problems for the president um, and his domestic policy agenda, uh, or maybe not if they find that they have to compromise and he can actually get some things done. Um, but what will it do for the foreign policy agenda? Um, how do you see it impacting, uh, you know, the, the, what the administration wants to do in Asia and globally? And will this president be perhaps more engaged uh, with foreign policy, more engaged with relations in Asia and, and with China, and, you know, perhaps try to define his presidency in the last two years as kind of a lame duck domestically on those foreign policy issues? Yeah, the, the, I, I, get, I think you're making two very interesting points. What will, uh, what will Republican, uh, if Republicans get control of the Senate, what will their behavior uh, do in terms of presidential behavior? And then secondly, just as a lame duck, is, is the president more likely to do a little more international? Historically, that second point tends to have elements of truth to it. It's hard for me to offer a prediction on Barack Obama, but historically, presidents who are stymied at home tend to spend disproportionate effort internationally, uh, where the U.S. Constitution just gives the president more, more power. So I, normally, I wouldn't be surprised if that happens. This president's not had a keen interest in shaping international outcomes. In fact, it's, not, it's certainly not isolationist, but it's been somewhat passive, I'd say, in his approach to, to international behavior. So I, it's never, I think, been his mission to say, I'm here to engage China, I've got a plan for the Mideast, or, you know what, I'm, these last two years I'm going to work with Ukraine and we're going to try to get some kind of favorable equilibrium out of uh, out of Eastern Ukraine. I mean, that's never, that's never, to my mind, been a big motivator for him. So, so I, I'd have, I'd have trouble betting on that. I'd have trouble saying, boy, that's his, that's his normal predisposition. Uh, but your other point, I think, is, is maybe more interesting. That, uh, what would a Republican majority encourage him to do or allow him to do? And, and you might see at the margin uh, um, a greater likelihood for trade promotion authority, for example, that he knows he's. He's operating with a, his back is covered, that he won't get lightning bolts of criticism if he goes on that. So you might see that. And you probably see at least a halt in the decline of the defense budget. You'd at least, I don't think you see an uptick, but I think you'd at least see, look, we, we don't think we're better off by cutting defense anymore. So, so those are at the margin, I think you'd see those two indicators if Republicans got control of the Senate. Frank, I want to uh, pick up on your point about uh, Obamacare being an unlikely winner for the Democrats. Um, so what do you see is likely to happen in the run-up to the elections? And what do you think should happen if they were going to use it to support Democratic votes? And what do you think the fate of Obamacare is if Republicans came to power in 2016? Are you talking about the midterms or 2016? Or? Um, well, I guess first the midterms and yeah. then... The, I think the, the midterms, there probably is a little bit of passion there, and it probably does hurt the Democrats. But again, part of that is because the environment, or these tend to be Republican states. I think two more years go by, the, the saliency of the issue fades. And I, in fact, I'd advise Republicans to be very judicious in their discussion of this, because people want the election to be about the future. And even if you're genuinely unhappy, you think this was a failure, you, you're, you're talking something five years ago. Um, so I, I, it's just not the right way to frame your, frame your campaign. Um, so my guess is it fades quite a bit uh, as, as a salient issue. And I also think, you know, the Obama will be pretty good at saying, what do you say? Well, we sure had a bumpy launch. It sure was more complicated than we thought, but it was the right idea. And our country's better off because now millions of people have access to health care than before. So you still kind of hold out that, by the way, I don't think any of that's particularly true, but, but, but your ability to say that is pretty strong, right? And, and, the, and the point is your base is placating. Your base says, yes, we're trying to do the right thing and Republicans are being snitty because the web page didn't work and that's the Republican mess. So, so I don't think it's a, a big issue and I think the base is okay on it, but I don't, I don't think it's a, it's, it's a lift for the Democrats either. Uh, Frank, can I ask another question? The, uh it's stepping way back from all this. Um, what's it saying about the political process in the United States if we end up with a, a Bush-Clinton candidacy, uh, a race for presidency? That goes back how many, how many years now to have two families dominating what is supposed to be a democratic yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. society. What's, what is this saying about the evolution of politics in America? 
Um, well, one of my conclusions is there's an evolution toward um, personality-led activity. It was striking to me in the 08 campaign, um, in, in, a, in a campaign which ultimately was determined by the global financial crisis, and I think that's, that gave Obama a lift at, at the, in the final few weeks. But what was striking to me was the initial impetus of that campaign was Iraq, uh, and the two, the McCain and Obama, the two nominees were the two people with the strongest personal narratives, the most interesting personalities. Um, I, I think they're both pretty capable guys as well, but it was interesting to me that, that somebody like Romney faded in that field because he's not particularly interesting. Uh, but, but it makes you wonder, is, is American political culture sort of merging with celebrity culture where, we, uh, where we're just comfortable with established brands and established names? Um, and you know, it's not necessarily a comment on American sociology because the country, the media market is so huge and the ability to break through clutter and to get a campaign going requires something to start with. And if you've got that brand name, that's a, that's a pretty good base. But that might be where we're at, that, that someone who has some kind of exogenous rationale for the candidacy just does better than a, you know, think of some of these governors and senators. I mean, some of these people are pretty highly regarded as, you know, having done competent jobs in their state. It's very tough to go from that base. The guy four years ago was in that box was uh, Tim Pawlenty, right? It was viewed as a competent manager, and he just got no no traction at all. And indeed, I think you could you could sense in some of those these, those debates where they had eight or ten people at podiums. Some of those debates where the the member of Congress from his state who had a sort of a stronger personality, uh, but had no legislative record was. Uh, Michelle Bachman, and you could tell it just drove him nuts that he was he spent you know eight years of his life running a state budget and trying to do all these things we want governors to do, and nobody cared in the room, right? And uh, and somebody gives a fiery speech and it gets a lot of applause. So it does it does make you wonder if we American sort of popular culture merges with political culture. Well, look, that's why I think we need people in leadership positions to be politically active, so you can add hopefully some some. You can leaven, you know, the emotions of the moment with a bit of analysis about where, where do you want America to be in five years or ten years, and what kind of policy is going to get us there. And that's what we all hope elections are going to be about. Yes. Sorry, Sorry if you already covered this, because apologies, I came in late. But I mean, on that kind of same theme, you know, 30, 40 years ago, you actually did have Congress working across party lines. Not only would they like talk to each other, but they'd actually yeah. come to some resolution on some things. Yeah. But that seems to have gone away entirely. Do you, do you think that that lack of bipartisan behavior is going to just keep going? Or do you, I mean, because it's not yeah. very useful. Yeah, it's not, it's not, it's not, it's not useful. Um, yeah, it's hard to say because I think some of it has to do with particular dynamics of the current administration. And, you know, whether you like Obama or not, he would say, look, for the first two years, I didn't need anybody. I had the House, I had the Senate. My big, my head, I ran for office with two big goals, get out of Iraq right away and get this health care plan through, and I did them both. So you'd have to say, so you'd have to say, you know what, I wasn't elected to be bipartisan. I was like to get my agenda through, and I got it through. So you said, say, well, you, you know, you did it. Right, right, but doesn't, didn't it start sort of several turns yeah. ago? Yeah, I was just with, saying, with I was just saying is, is, kind of is, vote against something because we decide? Yeah, but, but I guess I'm saying when we say we're for bipartisanship, what, what do we mean? Do we mean we're for a level of civic behavior where there's mutual respect? Yeah, I'm all for that. But, but does that mean I'm for compromising on issues? You've asked Obama, why don't I say, look, I won, I won on a platform and I carried out my platform, right? And in fact, if I had said my goal here is to work with the Republicans, is that's not why we voted for you, right? So I'd say, you know, democracy worked. You had, you had a clear cut case of a guy prevailing in a partisan setting. Right? And, and as I said, you can, be, you can be happy about Barack Obama, you can be unhappy about Barack Obama, but you cannot be surprised. I mean, he did what he said he was going to do. But I, but I think, so, so I think I'd agree with you, you're talking about sort of civic behavior, that rancor in the public space is corrosive and it cheapens the system. So uh, for that, but I think you say as a part of legislative strategy or presidential leadership, you need to be bipartisan. I'd say, no, I don't think that's accurate. I think you need to be as bipartisan as the situation requires for you to get your agenda ahead. So you've had some great moments where uh, Ronald Reagan worked with then Senator Lloyd Benson and they lowered the 
tax rate to 28%. Uh, they agreed, there were certainly people on both sides who said that's not a good idea, but we agreed to lower. Newt Gingrich worked with Bill Clinton to get uh, work requirements for welfare that you had to work, right? So you had agreements with that. Uh, Bill Clinton said, I'm going to support NAFTA, right? So just philosophically, he, and he got more Republican votes for NAFTA than he got Democratic votes, right? So, so there have certainly been moments over the last few decades where it stood out, but I think that was, that was a political calculus. I don't think anybody began and woke up in the morning and said, how can I be bipartisan? I think people woke up in the morning and said, how can I get my agenda through, right? So, but I would, if I were advising Barack Obama and he just came to office, I'd say, you know, you, if that's your goal to get that agenda through, go get that agenda through. And what's the point of sitting down with John Boehner, Mitch McConnell, right? Now, you stiff these guys or you do it in a clumsy way, you're going to build ill will and watch out. One of them might be running the show at some point, so watch out, right? And, and by the way, you better be dead sure that your health care policy is the right policy. You better be dead sure getting out of Iraq is the right thing to do. But, but you won the election, so go carry out your policy, right? I, I, I would... I wouldn't criticize him for carrying out his policy. I wouldn't criticize him for not being bipartisan. I mean, you could say philosophically you disagree with what he was doing, but that's, that's what elections are for. He won. So, yeah. Thank you. Uh, why do I think of Lyndon Johnson when you say that? But anyway, uh, on that point, but even further on that point, there was just a biography released on, on Nelson Rockefeller. Which yeah. Had, yeah, Richard Norton Smith. Yeah, yeah. Which, which looks like it's pretty good, but a lot of commentary on it and a lot of the analysis wasn't so much about Nelson Rockefeller one way or the other, but how the system has changed, not necessarily bipartisanship, yeah. Yeah. but what you were talking about, the primary system, for example, if it has that a lot, that a candidate, it makes it difficult for certain candidates to, who might be electable to sure. get through that, on, really on both sides. Sure. Is that a problem? Maybe it's not a problem, or is, or is, is that something that can even be changed? Well, but, but also this is, I mean, this is interesting because so you've moved from kind of, I think, personal, uh, collegial, you know, political discourse to more uh, large-scale mass political discourse, but and you'd say that's has cost with it because uh, if it's large-scale mass political discourse, you're disproportionately rewarding uh, pugnacity, right? So, so it requires a degree of uh, of sort of muzzle velocity to break through cluttered media. Um, uh, so, so unfortunately, that's ten, those voices are disproportionate. But the other side of the coin is, guess what? He moved away from a political governance structure which was close to 100% white, male, middle class, uh, college educated, and it's just demographically more diverse. So your ability to socially run the thing, I mean, what do you think the House of Parliament was like in the 1950s? You know, it was, I remember, uh, you know, Bob, uh, Ben Bradley just passed away, the public, long Post, Washington Post, a great, great obituary in the Washington Post. I think he's a very impressive guy, very life, for life state. And you're reading, the, and he's got a lot of adventures in life. But I think it's when he, uh, uh, I think I think it's when he becomes editor of the Washington Bureau of Newsweek, uh, and and he's asked, well, I, you know, how did you get the job? He said, oh, it was very easy. Uh, my second wife was good friends of. Catherine Graham from Miss Porter School, they were both, or Miss Chapin School. We're both on the both on the track team together. I said, "Yeah, it is pretty easy, I guess, if that's how it works. That's pretty cool. If, if you're if you're a winner through that system, that's pretty cool. But you know, and, and somebody like Barack Obama never becomes president. But you'd say we're probably better off having a more open system where a guy can come with no family background, no money at all, and kind of show up. But he's a hell of a good speaker, and he had a specific idea where we want to take America. So you're probably better off in that kind of a polity." But it probably also says, you know, who are, so who are Barack Obama's best personal friends in the Senate? Right, so like, I think the answer is zero. I think the guy, I think the guy, I mean, well, I've talked to guys a lot. I asked, I, asked, uh, I asked the question a different way to a good friend of mine on the White House staff. I said, you know, uh, George Bush's best friend uh, who was a foreign head of government was Tony Blair. He had a very collegial, very warm relationship with him. That's, and it's frequently, you know, the guy from Britain, right? So, uh, so that no surprise there. But they had a very good relationship. Who is Barack Obama's best friend overseas? Which head of state? Who does he, who does he say, God, I've got a problem, or I'm really glad this person's come to see me, I just want to share some thoughts? Who is his best friend? But because this is a guy, the point is not that he's not, not that he's antisocial, that's not my point. My point is, my point is he grew up outside the system. He grew up within the system. He's not an establishment guy. He didn't spend three. Now, if you ask that question of Hillary Clinton, or more importantly, as you said, Ivan, of Bill Clinton, 
Bill Clinton would say, well, I've got about 80 friends who are heads of this. <laughs> Hillary would say, I've got, I've got five who I really count on. You know, there are these five people I really go to internationally, and they're really pretty good, and I work with them all the time, right? And, and so, you know, that's, but that's, that's America's choice. We say we don't want the establishment person who grew up in that system. We want the anti-establishment person, and that's how democracy works. So you got a guy, I don't, I don't think he has personal friends in the Senate. I don't think he has any personal friends in foreign governments, right? <laughs> Right, he didn't. He was annoyed. They said. They said. By the By the way, Reagan. Reagan was much like that, but Reagan could be coached. Reagan's starting point was, you know, I'm not necessarily excited about seeing any of these guys, but I know I have to fake it, right? So Reagan would say, "We'll go. We'll go through the meeting." Well, well, that's acting. Yeah. So, but, but I mean, at least he got it that he's a political leader and he's got to connect with people he's got very little in common with. He's got to try to make them feel good. So at least got that. And Clinton just wallows in it. I'm mean, Bill Clinton. I mean, Clinton lives for the chance to, to, to meet people and to, you know, have a connection with them and stuff. So. Any other questions? Great. Uh, great, 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 great. Not a Thank presentation, you. but an analysis, but Thanks, buddy. great answers. It was Good a lot of fun. Well, great crowd, great crowd. Thank you. Thank you. Got something for me? Thank you. Thank you. Good. It's legal. It's legal. Thank you. Thank you very much.